Good evening, everybody. Can, can you all see me okay? I'm going to do better if I am down here instead of up there, because I can't see the screen from there. Um, <laughs> we're good? Okay, terrific. Uh, how many of you all this evening work at an institution that has recently gone through an educational transformation of some kind? Just show of hands, anyone recently gone through that? Anyone going through that now? Anybody? Okay. Uh, anybody going at an institution that is dealing with major systemic change, with initiatives, changes in curriculum, changes in program, reorganizing? Yep, I think pretty much everybody's raised their hands this evening. That's really what I'd like to visit with you all about this evening, is, uh, is this question of, of change and big change and kind of systemically how we organize ourselves. Um, but before I get started with that, I'm, I want to ask uh, something of y'all. Uh, you should find near you a little cut-out paper heart on your table. Um, and there are markers and pens on the table as well. Um, I, I know they say you're not supposed to multitask, but while I'm talking, while the program's going on this evening, I'd like you to have a question going through the back of your mind that I think really what we're talking about here at this convention keeps coming back to, because I'm in conversations at the Capitol and at the coordinating board and, and uh, groups in Austin that are dealing with education, usually at a policy level, and <clears throat> it's a very different conversation than the one that you're having at your institution with your colleagues. Very different languages, di very different frame of reference. And what I find with faculty is that what draws them to this work is very different from what draws someone doing policy work. People doing policy work are doing good, important work. I'm fans of them, they're, they're terrific, but it's different. And so I'd like for you to be thinking while we're talking uh, this evening about this question. <clears throat> Why is your heart in this work? Why do you do what you do? Because with all of the changes and disruptions and stresses that you are placed under on a pretty regular basis, I think we need to remember why we do this in the first place and why it matters. So while we're talking and things are going on this evening, just contemplate that question. And uh, as thoughts come into your mind, um, just jot them down on the, on the little heart uh, and then leave them on the tables. We'll be collecting them and we'll have them out there uh, tomorrow. So if you do that, then I'm, I'm just dying to see what y'all come up with. So uh, as y'all may know, when people have legal issues, employment issues at their institution, I'm often the person that they call. And they say, usually the conversation starts with, I need to talk to a lawyer. <clears throat> and one, I'm not an attorney. I don't have a, a law degree. And I'm not licensed to practice law in the state of Texas. So. Uh, I always make, make it clear about that. Um, often it's not a legal issue. Um, it's, you know, it's some personality conflict or, or something else. Um, but they'll call and we'll kind of work through the, uh, the issue. <clears throat> so I try and remember that the phone calls I get in my office are not really representative of just what's going on statewide, right? I mean, I rarely get calls from members saying, just want to let you know, everything's great, I love my job, <laughs> my boss is wonderful, the students are great, everything's, everything's good. <clears throat> so I understand that I, it's kind of a, an unrepresentative uh, sample that, that tends to call me. Except, usually, every semester, usually right before finals week, I get a call from a member <clears throat> who I originally spoke to 12, 15 years ago. And he was having very serious problems. Turns out, in his case, it was not a legal issue. It was, it was just a conflict that he had with his, uh, with his dean. And uh, it, the dean just had it out for this faculty member. <clears throat> and he gave this faculty member bad schedules, the classes nobody else wanted to teach. At times, they didn't want to teach. He had to drive to the other side of the district to teach some of his classes. It was, the, the dean was being mean, OK? I mean, it was just it was a, a bad situation. But nothing illegal was happening. We couldn't compel the college or the dean to do anything different. So we couldn't just make the problem stop. But the member would call me <clears throat> from time to time just to say, this is, this is a difficult, hard situation. And he, he just wanted out. <clears throat> but he persisted. He stuck with it. 
And one day he called me and he said that this dean was retiring. And uh, that's what solved the problem. There was a joyous retirement party <laughs> and <clears throat> the problem went away. Ever since that happened, I get a call every semester from this member <clears throat> just telling me, just want to let you know things are great. I love my job, the students are wonderful, my boss is wonderful, and, and I really appreciate that call. Um, doesn't have to do it. I usually get a call at the end of a, of a case just to let me know how it wound up, but that's the end of it. It's just the one call. But I get this call every semester, <clears throat> and I know it's not representative, but I, I appreciate getting, uh, getting the call. So one more story. Um, several legislative sessions ago, <clears throat> we were dealing with an issue that at the time was called momentum points. It's now called success points. It's outcomes-based funding from, uh, from the, that the legislature appro appropriates to our colleges. It had come up for a couple of sessions prior and we had pushed it back and said it, it wasn't a good idea. The message we got just un unequivocally from our members was that it was not going to be a good idea and so we explained why. <clears throat> This session, though, this particular session, um, everybody lined up behind it. The Commissioner of Higher Education was pushing very strongly for it. Uh, the governor at the time, Rick Perry, uh, said he was going to hold up the appropriations bill if, this, uh, if this, uh, the momentum points bill didn't pass. Everybody was behind it. Uh, TACC endorsed it. Uh, even the unions, the, the two unions that, uh, that are in Texas for community colleges, came out in favor of the bill and we did not, and we were under enormous pressure because the appropriations bill was, was hanging in the balance. So one morning I was at my daughter's uh, swim meet and I get a text from the, the chief of staff from the Senate Higher Education Committee saying, we have to pass this bill out of committee, what's it gonna take? And so we texted back and forth, my daughter did great in her swim meet, and we came to, uh, to an agreement which was that we would we would not support the bill, but we would not object to the bill if uh, no funding was attached to it. So you can track all the measurements you want, you can uh, collect all the data, but let's not tie dollars to it. And so that's what happened, and that bill passed. And it bought us time. And we, uh, over the course of really three sessions that we had been pushing back on it, the issue of success points and outcomes-based funding really matured, and so what we're living under now, while still not something we endorse or support, uh, is better than what it was when it, when it started. But I mentioned this story because when this came up, we were not hearing from anyone that there was a problem. No one in Austin was talking about this being a problem, and they kind of looked at us funny, like, why are you talking about this? Nobody's objecting to this but you. We weren't getting feedback from our members because y'all weren't really aware at the time, you know, what's going on in Austin in real time during the session. We were kind of pushing the message out, but we really weren't hearing much back from members on it. But we knew that this was gonna be a problem and that come September, after the session was long over, we were gonna wish that we had taken a strong position on, on this legislation. So we had to make a call in the absence of data, in the absence of really any feedback, uh, how we're, what's our position going to be? And so we made the best call that we could, and uh, and I th and I think we prevailed. And since then, we've heard from members, gotten that feedback, and and I think we we played that hand uh, uh, pretty well. But it wasn't because of data. It wasn't because we had uh, some information that we could point to to say, uh, here's what what people say on this. So. The unrepresented anecdote, the faculty member calling saying, just want to let you know I love my job. Um, making decisions in the absence of, of information and data um, creates a lot of tensions and dilemmas. So Donald Rumsfeld, uh, Secretary of Defense during the Iraq War, do you remember this where he says, there are things we know we know about terrorism, there are things we know we don't know, and there are things we, and there are unknown unknowns. We don't know that we don't know. Well, when he said that, people kind of ridiculed that. It's kind of a silly thing to say. I think it was probably the wisest thing that was said during that administration. Um, that was, well, I don't, this isn't about George, but I'm, I'm just saying, it, 
that is a very powerful insight, the, these unknown unknowns. Because we spend most of our time with unknowns and probably with unknowns, un unknown unknowns, things we don't, questions we don't even know to ask. And yet we have to make decisions, right, in real time, either because it's urgent and we just have to right then, or because it would just be wildly inefficient to exhaust everything there is to know about something before we made even little decisions. So we do our best. We get the information we can, we talk to people, um, and we make a judgment, and we try and make a decision. Errol Morris, the documentary filmmaker, he actually did a documentary, hours of interviews with, Errol, with uh, uh, Rumsfeld. If you, if you can ever watch that documentary, it's, it's fascinating. He wrote a series of articles in the New York Times Sunday Magazine several years ago about this, uh, this phenomenon called anosognosis and issues related to it. So anosognosis is a medical condition, actually, where people who have lost limbs to amputations don't know that they've lost the limb. So they, they don't have an arm and are not aware of it, uh, or a leg, and they don't know that, they've, that they're missing a leg. And this sort of unknown, unknown, they don't even know that it's missing, uh, raises all sorts of psychological, medical, philosophical questions. Um, Morris talked to David Dunning as a part of his research on this. Have you heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Has anybody heard of this? Dunning-Kruger uh, is, uh, it's a, it's, it's a uh, psychological term and uh, it says that the, the skills that are required to uh, know that you're good at something are the same as being good at that thing. And so what that means is when we're not good at something, we're in the worst position to know we're not good at it. You may know this from your students. <laughs> if you ask your students, how do you think you did on your last test? Often the ones who did poorest on the test are the ones that overestimate how they did on that test. And often the ones that got A's on the test are just agonizing about that one question they missed. But we, if we don't know what we don't know, we're not really in a position to, to evaluate our, uh, where we are. And so we, we struggle, and we have to make decisions and use good judgment and do our best. What Dunning says the, the, the way out of this dilemma, um, more than anything else, he says the road to self-insight runs through other people. That it's the relationships we have, the feedback that we can get from other people that are the best correctives to our bad decisions, our blind spots, the, the, the unknown unknowns. And it's the, the ability to create feedback loops where we're listening to each other and getting this insight that puts us in the best position to make um, good decisions. When we talk about education or uh, data in Texas, more than anything else, right, we're talking about 60 by 30 TX. And I assume everybody in the room has heard 60 by 30 TX. You might even know there's a website, 60 by 30 TX.com. Uh, here they have the overarching goals, and this represents the higher education, overarching higher education agenda for Texas for 15 years and it goes through 2030. It follows up on the closing the gaps agenda that we had up until 2015. And this really outlines what we're trying to accomplish as a state in higher education. Um, it's broken out by region, and so you can see how you're doing in your part of the state. You can go to the website and it'll show you this is how this part of the state is doing uh, in terms of academic achievement and in terms of meeting the goals of, of, uh, of 60 by 30. And this is all important information. There will be sessions tomorrow. I encourage you to go to them. There's a lot to absorb there. I don't want to talk about it tonight. But uh, there, uh, you can go to the website and you can uh, go to the sessions tomorrow where we'll be digging into, into that data. But what I find when I talk with faculty is that there's often a disconnect that they feel between what they see in the, in the policy discussions in Austin, in the 60 by 30 agenda around higher education, it just doesn't seem to connect with their students because they know their students and it doesn't sound at all like, like what they see in their students. It feels like they speak a different language, just the frame of reference, the things that they, 
the words that they use for things aren't the same as what you would use on a college campus. They don't understand their students and often don't have a lot of interaction, direct interaction with them. And they, we spend too much time collecting and talking about data. On, like on a college campus, you've got all these meetings, you're always having to report data, data, data. Does it, is, is this true? Does it feel this way sometimes on your campus? That, it, that we've kind of lost our balance in terms of the, the way we spend our time. And so we wind up in the sort of, this just does not feel right. I'm kind of in a, uh, I'm, I'm just feeling the tension between my lived reality and what's happening out in Austin. So uh, George Box has this, had this theory back in the 1970s. And what he says is that all models are wrong. The practical question is how wrong do models have to be to not be useful? And it, he's, he's getting at that question of if we did nothing all day long but collect data, we might be able to collect all the data, all the, every bit of information about a discrete topic and know that topic inside and out and just completely exhaust what there is to know about the topic. But it would be so unwieldy, it would just, you just wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense, right? And so what he says is that all models are wrong to some extent because we don't do that, and we shouldn't do that. The question is, how wrong can it be and still be useful? There's, a, uh, there's this idea called the Bodini paradox. Have you heard of this? So there's a, uh, uh, if, we, if we get these models, the, the, the Bodini paradox actually relates originally to, to maps, and there are these stories, uh, fictional stories, about people who created maps and they wanted the map to be 100% accurate, just we're not leaving out any bit of detail. The problem is the maps were at a one-to-one -one scale, like one mile to one mile. And so there's one story about an entire empire that is completely covered by a map of the empire, but it's a perfectly accurate map. But it's not very practical, right? And so they wound up getting rid of the map and just using the empire as a map of itself because the, the map itself really wasn't, uh, wasn't useful. Well, this is all kind of taking things to a ridiculous extreme, but it is something that I think if you're on a college campus and you're trying to spend quality time with your students and you're constantly having to collect data about what you're doing as you're doing it, you can wind up in this, in this predicament of saying how, how much is enough and when is it more than, than, than we can actually use uh, in, a, in a useful way. Um, the map is not the country uh, is what the the Bodini um, paradox concludes. Uh, Alan Watts, the philosopher, says similarly, the, the menu is not the meal. And we need to distinguish between the data and the lived experience that the data um, is referring to. And so we can sometimes feel like we're drowning in data, that it's, it's just it's overwhelming and not as useful as, as we need it to be. So as I was trying to think this evening, um, OK, we, I've, kind of articulated a, a dilemma that I hear a lot of our members describe, uh, but what are we gonna do about it? And so I've, I've tried to think about some things that might be useful for people who are, are dealing with this uh, predicament. One first absolute thing to do is to find good source of sources of information. There is a lot of information out there. If you Google it, you will find all kinds of information, most of it not very helpful, and a lot of it not very accurate. So find information that is useful and is accurate. I would recommend the data that TACC collects. They're very good at that. We collect good data as well, and I would recommend that. And the Texas Tribune, I think it's the most important publication in Texas uh, when it comes to state government, including higher education. Um, visit their website every day. You'll learn something that, uh, that's gonna be useful. Also, start with the assumption that there's something you don't know that you need to know, and listen intently. So when you're listening, when you're talking with people who are, say, talking about data and these sort of, the, this kind of level of abstraction where you're dealing about policy around what you do, um, it's easy to dismiss it and say, you know what, I, I'm busy, I don't want to think about it. I would say, listen, and just assume they know something I don't know. They know something that's going to be helpful to me, and I want to, uh, I want to understand that. And also interpret it generously. Um, Ezra Klein, he's got a podcast with the Fox Media. Um, Vox, not Fox. Um, he uses the term strong manning an argument. That you, you know the term straw manning an argument, where you give a weak version of an argument and then beat the weak version of the argument and feel like you've won. 
He says, make the argument as strong as you possibly can, especially if you disagree with it, and then engage with that version of it, because then you're really going to know that you're dealing with, um, with something that's valid and something that needs to be wrestled with, and you're not just trying to, to dismiss it and, and, uh, and, and not deal with it fairly. Also, remember the an anosognosis question. What are we not asking? Um, what do we need to be digging into that we're missing? Um, I'm saying this really for y'all on, on a college campus, but I would say these very same things for people in Austin. What are the questions they're not asking? What are their blind spots? What are things that a faculty member would know just intuitively that they wouldn't because they're not in your position? So this needs to, to go both ways um, as we go along. And seek out alternative perspectives. I saw a bumper sticker a while ago. It says, you're not stuck in traffic. You are the traffic. Um, <laughs> That's kind of a hard truth to, to accept. <laughs> but it's true, and I think if you can take yourself out of, out of your perspective and really look, okay, what's really going on here? You're gonna see something that was there all the time and, and you just missed it uh, if, you're, if you're able to put yourself in that, in that space. Um, and also understand that you're not just consumers of data, that this is a conversation you need to be involved in, partly in terms of providing data helping people who are making policy decisions understand what they need to know to make good decisions, um, but also to help them ask questions. Because I feel like there is an enormous amount that we miss if we don't have good data, if we just work at the level of anecdote. There's just too much else happening. The, the, the context is so big and influences us so deeply. We need to be engaged with it. Um, but there are things that we, that we miss if, all we're, if, if we're only at that level and we're not talking to an actual student and listening, what does this look like in real life when you're dealing with a, with a quirky, idiosyncratic student who has their own uh, unique situation? So make it a conversation and find ways um, to engage in it. Build time to think. Um, this, I, actually, I wish this, we need to do sessions entirely on this. I really, I have, I'm, I am absolutely convinced the biggest crisis we have right now in higher education is that everybody is frantic all the time. Everybody is frantic, and people don't make good decisions when they're frantic. I mean, you think about the decisions you have to make, and you say, I'm going to give this 20 seconds when I should probably give it an hour, or maybe wait until tomorrow. But no, i got to go. I can't think. And so we, we don't spend our time well, which makes us even more frantic because we're not acting as efficiently as we otherwise would, but we're not really paying attention because we stay so busy. And I think this is a, a matter of self-discipline. It's a matter of insisting on how am I going to spend my time and really make sure that I'm present to what's going on in front of me and I'm making good decisions and engaging with it in that way instead of just the, the dis constantly distracted um, frame. Also, hold your values tightly and hold your opinions loosely. I think this is really important, because especially when you're dealing with somebody you disagree with, right? Because you can hold every opinion you've got just like with a death grip, um, and you're going to miss an awful lot. Um, you could also hold things so loosely that even the things that really do matter uh, could get lost. And so you need to know what, are the, what is the difference and how can I engage with it uh, authentically. Um, and if you spend most of your time with data, find your way into a classroom. And if you're in the classroom more, make sure you spend some time to get familiar with the data that informs, uh, and that whole micro, uh, macro context that informs um, the reality in the classroom. Appreciate that education is a human endeavor and students are not data points. This is, they, they can't be reduced to that. And so this is just inexhaustibly complicated, interesting, <laughs> Uh, there's always more to discover, and we can't just reduce things to zeros and ones, um, you know, pixels on a screen. Um, but if we can do some of these things, I think that it puts us in a position where we can um, begin to see how the dots connect, how the, the picture emerges, how it goes from just, I had this experience with a student, I had another experience, I've had a semester of experiences with students. I've had a year, 
I've had 10 years, I've had a career of experiences with students, and those things have, have created an entire comprehensible understanding that isn't any one point, but it's the totality of the experience. And when you can connect all of those points with all of the points that other people have, then you have a much richer, more textured understanding of the students that you're dealing with and the, the mission, what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. So this is, I, this is kind of fascinating to me. You may have noticed when that thing started, when the image started scanning back, it started out as pixels, right? And I'm, so I'm saying students aren't pixels, and we start with pixels. But if you've ever seen this painting, it's seven feet, I think it's seven feet by 10 feet. It's this enormous uh, uh, painting by Surratt. Um, he doesn't use pixels. If you go, if, if the museum will let you get close enough, you'll see those are not pixels. They're not zeros and ones and, and little squares. It's paint on canvas, and there's a texture. You can see the, the canvas and the, the texture of the canvas coming through. You can see brush strokes, and each one of these things is, is unique. These are not dot, 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 dot. That there's an artistry in these micro gestures happening on the screen, and it's beautiful. And I think we need to appreciate what's happening at that scale. It's not, what you see, the beauty isn't just in the, when you see it at a distance. The other thing that's kind of interesting about this, this painting is that when Surratt painted it in the, in the 1800s, it's, it's called, I think it's called Saturday on the Island of Jacques, um, which is in Paris. Um, this was during the Industrial Revolution, and he had a, a powerful aversion to the Industrial Revolution and what it was doing to French society. What he said was that it was atomizing people and they went from being social creatures uh, to being cogs in a, in a literal machine, that they were becoming a part of an industrial machine. And so he's taking these dots, which kind of atomized dots, and he was trying to create a, a picture out of that. But what you see here is that these people on a Sunday afternoon at the park are not talking with each other. There is no social interaction. Every face in the painting is in shadow. And there's no engagement. There's, I mean, there, it's these lifeless images, uh, lifeless people in this, in this park. And he's saying that something very powerful is lost when we think that all that matters um, is, is the, 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 that big machine, <clears throat> that salvation really is found uh, in, in the details and in the individual. So these are some thoughts I have. I, I'm in this weird position that Bill was describing a minute ago <laughs> where um, I, I visit college campuses a lot and I talk about what's going on in Austin. And when I'm in Austin, I'm talking about what's going on in the college campuses and, and uh, among our members and what I'm, what I'm hearing from you. And so I feel like I'm reporting from what's happening in, in two different countries. <laughs> Let me tell you what's going on in that country over there. Um, and it's, it's important messages uh, to get back and forth. Sometimes I feel like there are these two rooms and I'm standing in this doorway and I see people over here and I see people over here in this room. They both kind of know that there are people in the other room but they don't really know what they're doing and they really don't want to get to know them very well. They don't trust each other often. Um, and I'm saying you really need to get to know each other because you're both gonna be better off if you do. Um, I think it makes you a better faculty member if you know what's going on in Austin. Um, partly because it'll inform what you're doing on campus, partly because it'll lead to better policies because you're engaged uh, in that. And I think it makes them better policy makers and they, they get better at the craft of policy uh, by having interaction, familiarity with your world, which really only comes through you. And so your involvement in it creates a connection, a relationship, and that kind of deep textured pattern um, that gets to the reality of it. So it's not just these sweeping gestures and strange um, abstractions that don't look familiar to you, that don't speak to the reality that, that you live. 
Um, I was, I, I have to say, I was very impressed and also kind of intimidated when Bill uh, was first telling me what the theme was for this year, because it's a challenging theme. And you can tell the, the, the words in the theme, there are more words in our theme this year than there usually are. We usually have like three or four words. This is harder to wrap our minds around. Um, and it's hard to talk about. And normally when you're talking about data and policy things, you're talking about, okay, I'm gonna go to the session, I'm gonna learn about 60 by 30. But there's something beneath that, which is where I think faculty live, which is, okay, this is talking about something and it needs to be real. And I, that's what I care about. I think that may be why your heart is in that work, although you're, you, have, you have your way of saying that and seeing that. Um, I wanna make sure that as an organization, we're communicating the, the rich textured message and not the superficial message. And so I'm hoping in this coming year, and especially in the lead up to this next legislative session, which is gonna be wild, that you will be involved in it. Pay attention, find ways to connect. And I hope you'll use TCCTA as, as, as a device to help you zoom in and out. Like, you know, like in Google Maps, you can zoom in and, and zoom out. Kind of use us as a way to, to do that, to, to get close to what's going on with the conversation in Austin, uh, to bring that back home to your colleagues so that they'll know what's, what's happening in Austin, and to bring their world uh, to, to the work that, that's being done by legislators. Here's some of the things that I th think about. Uh, I, I hope it, it's informative to you. I hope you see also that what TCCTA is trying to do is more than just uh, let's do professional development and we'll tell you about X. We do that and I think we bring in the best speakers and resources you'll find anywhere. But it's more than that. It's really more about the relationships that happen among you and between you and, the, and those experts that, that we bring in. It's the conversations that happen in the Q&A or after a session is over and you go up to the, mic to the podium and talk with the speaker about what's going on. Um, that it's the human experience of it more than even the information that's conveyed uh, that matters most. So um, I, hope, I hope you find some of these thoughts helpful. Um, how are your hearts coming? I hope you've had a little time to think about what's, uh, what you might write on them. Um, we are gonna be posting them on the, on the thing out there in the foyer tomorrow. And I hope you'll take a little time and just look, see what your friends wrote, what your colleagues wrote. Why is their heart in this work? Because I think what you'll find is that you're not alone, that you're surrounded by people who care just as deeply as you do, struggle with things, are inspired by things, and wanna be a part of something more. So thank you for your time. I hope you all have a great time at the conference.